But if you have this process called a metacognition or meta-awareness, just being curious, you realize, wait a minute, this isn't safe. And you know, and the number of times that we ignore our intuition because we confused it with the emotion, it's because we don't trust our intuition enough. It's because you can train your intuition. Probably the world's most famous biohacker. Dave Asprey is known as the father of biohacking. He's the founder and CEO of Bulletproof Coffee. How do you really train intuition without all of the tools that we have that anyone can do? Well, now we're asking the real questions here. Your body had to feel some things, even if your mind didn't. It needed to feel safe. What are some big movers for helping with cognitive function? The most accessible brain training on the planet is wow. Well, Dave, I appreciate you coming on. It's a lot of fun, and thanks for doing this in Austin. You made it real easy on me. Yeah, I mean, I really wanted to have this in-person experience to talk about. We are just talking off air about the 40 years of Zen experience mm -hmm. that I just had, and the word ineffable comes to <laughs> me <laughs> when I'm trying to talk about this with my friends, and you nailed it. I was like, how do I explain this to my mom? who's also never been you know, yeah. into biohacking or my friends, how would you do the honors uh, you know, of explaining right. this? Ele 11 years ago, I started working with neurofeedback uh, as a, a way to help clients and to help people who are making a big difference in the world. And a dozen years before that, I got my first piece of technology that could read my brain waves, put them on my computer, and then show my brain what it was doing. Mm. It's like showing a monkey in the forest a mirror for the first time. And they're like, oh my God, that's what I look like? Right. And then it starts you know, getting spinach out of its teeth. <laughs> right? So your brain is doing the same thing. And what we're doing at 40 Years In is we're compressing 20 or 30 or 40 years of daily meditation practice into five days. Because your brain wants to optimize so much that once it knows what it's doing, and once you learn the specific techniques, you can sit there and just watch your state transform and we're talking about states you've never felt before. Mm. And if you imagine, let's say that it was actually possible for you to fly, but you've never done it and you've never seen anyone else do it. How would you ever know it was possible to fly? How would you know what it felt like? How would you know how to stretch your wings? You actually wouldn't. And there are examples here where they'll, they'll take a bird and put it with chickens who can't fly. And those birds won't fly because no one ever thought of it. Mm. They don't learn. What we have in ancient literature is documentation of dozens of things that humans can do and that our brains can do when they're in the right state. And this comes from all kinds of different lineages. There's shamanic things, there's stuff out of India, stuff out of China, uh, there's ancient European things. They're all talking about the same stuff. Well, what if you just got the number of your brain? Which part of the brain has to light up with which other part of the brain at what frequency and what order? And it's like playing a song with your brain. So we teach how to do that. And normally, you sit in a cave for 20 years and learn from a teacher, and eventually you'll probably stumble onto it or sit in one of our pods for five days and just get it done. And it's comparable to things like plant medicine. In fact, someone who just came through said, this is the best plant medicine ceremony I've ever done without the plants. Hmm. So how is it that we're actually entering these ecstatic altered states without medication, your, your brain sees itself and all of a sudden the world expands. And if you ever talk to someone who just did uh, a heavy duty MDMA healing or, or taken a lot of mushrooms, they can't explain what they did. Oh, it was beautiful. It was big. It was great. People do the same thing. That's why ineffable, the word you used, is so beautiful. It's a yeah. word that means there isn't a word for it. The English language is so limited. It can't describe yeah. all of the experiences, particularly something like this, mm -hmm. in such a limited form. Yeah. And a lot of it is just felt sense. And I do some teaching of, of other techniques aside from just the things you learn at 40 Years of Zen, where yeah. there's a lot of the, the structured meditation practice that you do with the, the technology helping you do it. And that technology is unique. It's nowhere else in the world except 40 years of Zen. We have four patents on it now, actually. Wow. But sometimes I'll try to explain, okay, you're going to close your eyes and you're going to breathe in and you're going to breathe into your... Most people don't know how to breathe into their toes or breathe into their knees or breathe into their reproductive system, which is a really important skill because you're like, hey, dumbass, there's no lungs there. 
how could I breathe into it? And, and that is a very logical and rational and truthful sentence. Except when I'm saying breathe into, what I mean is tell your body to experience the feeling of expansion over that part of the body. And then you go, well, what does it feel like for a part of my body to expand that doesn't actually expand that way? And I don't know. Okay, work on that for six months. Or let's put some electrodes on your brain and just make the sounds get louder. Mm. And then you do it. Like, Whoa, I'm expanding. And that's why it's so much faster. Um, I wouldn't be sitting here today if I hadn't spent six months of my life with electrodes glued to my head doing 40 years of Zen practice to do the reset process on all kinds of things that probably would have taken most people down that I've been through. What were the before and after for you in terms of the results and what were you dealing with before that? Well, when I started the, the journey that became the biohacking movement, uh, before I was 30, I had never done any meaningful personal development stuff. Uh, and I'd been married and, and divorced. I had made $6 million when I was 26. And these were actually not Biden dollars. This was real money that had value. And then uh, I lost that when I was 28. So you've already made a life's fortune and lost it. You've already been through a major relationship. Um, How did you lose it? The dot-com crash. I was, I, I had inside information because I was an executive at the company that I helped to, mm. to get going. Uh, so I wasn't allowed to sell my shares. And I just watched my fortune go away. So that was stressful. And after that, I mean, I've, I've had an amazing tech career and an amazing career creating biohacking. And um, I, I don't have any complaints there, but there's been major ups and downs. And I'm not at Bulletproof anymore, which is a company that's done about $650 million in revenue that I started and wow. grew to, nor to more than 100 million. Uh, and then to get removed from my own board of directors, uh, that was shocking. Yep. And I've I, I recently consciously uncoupled and I've dealt with all kinds of stuff that, that most people don't even talk about, but I've had people in bezel, I've had you know employees just do sometimes the most, I, I would say the most rotten things, you know, they're like, oh, you know, I, I, I want something, so I'm just gonna make up stories. And so many of my entrepreneur friends and the people who come through 40 years of Zen, like really successful people, they actually have scars. We have scars from childhood, you know, from our parents doing their best, but maybe not as good as we needed at the time, or from a bully or many bullies or from teachers or coaches or just life situations. You know, if, if you're an immigrant, there's a pretty good chance that you got run out of your country. Right, so then there's this deep sense of of not having a home, and it's not a conscious thing. You didn't think of that. It's that your body's like, where's the land I'm supposed to connect to, the land of my ancestors? Because half of what the body does doesn't make any sense to us, because the body's not very rational. I mean, you got you you got into that at 40 mm -hmm. years in, right? Yep. So for me, I'd been I dealt with a lot of bullying. Uh, I had birth PTSD. I was born with a cord wrapped around my neck, so I was wired from really from day one to believe that um, really something was trying to kill me and I always had to be ready to fight. Wow. And this is common with birth trauma. So when people are you know choked or they use forceps and things like that, just choked by the cord, uh, it's no one's fault necessarily, but even um, a C-section can do that. So if your nervous system is set up that way and you're traumatized by that, and then, you know, I'm fortunate, I and my parents, you know, didn't didn't beat me or anything like that. Uh, but man, I had a lot of bullying, right? So you do that and you you come out and then you're an adult and you're building a career and then you get you know, betrayed, right? And this happens to almost everyone. By the time you become reasonably successful, reasonably powerful, you've had your heart broken a few times. You've had people who you trusted and you found out weren't trustworthy, right? And then you walk around going, I'm injured, but you're spiritually injured. You're, you're just going, well, okay, you know, that person broke my heart or that person um, you know, was my business partner and it turns out they stole the money, mm. right? And this happens so often and people don't even talk about it because of shame. And then you walk around holding tight and then you can't trust the next business partner. You can't mm. trust your next partner. You become jealous, you become bitter, you become angry and that makes you old. And ultimately what I realized when I, I got down this path and this includes going to the Himalayas and the Andes and remote parts of Nepal and Tibet it's that you can control your nervous system and you can teach yourself to consciously 
let go of all that stuff. So you know it was wrong, but it doesn't hurt you anymore. You can just talk about it. And I've done this reset process from 40 years of Zen with people who've been actually tortured in war situations. This is some of the most traumatizing thing you can do. We're wired to, to say, well, we're around other humans. It's supposed to be safe. Like we're supposed to work with each other. That's how animals are. And what happens then is that, like that is a really deep act of, of violation and betrayal and pain and all of that. And it gets into your nervous system, gets into your cells. And when people do the reset process on day one, they'll go, I was, I was tortured. And they can barely talk about it because thinking of it brings up physiological symptoms. Yeah, we've had people like shaking as, they're, as they were talking about it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And by the time they've done the reset process, they can sit there and they're like, yeah, I was tortured and I'm okay, right? And I, and I, it was terrible, I never wanna do it again, I wouldn't wish it on anyone, uh, and I'm okay. And they can say it because they've lost the emotion that was tied to it. Um, I had another guy come to 40 Years of Zen. He ran a 1200 person company in Mexico. And he came out and said, man, all of my success in business is because I was bullied in seventh grade. I'm just trying to prove I'm good enough even today. And then he changed his strategy to actually expand mm. instead of to run away from or to look a certain way. And it changes how you think about the world. You can be running away from the bullies when you're 50, or you can be being pulled towards a vision that matters when you're 50. And at some point in your life, hopefully in your 20s or 30s, if you're lucky, you make the switch. And that switch is just learning how to look inside your body and how to not be triggerable. Something can trigger you. It means you're carrying a loaded gun. Yep. And that's that's what what you did in all that time there. At least those first three days was. Sure. What are my buttons, and how do I take away the power behind the button? Yeah, it was tough. It was. It, it felt like shadow work. You know, really yeah. going deep in. And one of the things that really unlocked that I'm so thankful for is I've had imposter syndrome for a while, mm. and I realized as you know, Lisa and, and the facilitator kind of went into it is that. I went into a very untraditional path than what a typical Korean family would coming in as an immigrant, which was either you're a doctor or lawyer or a failure. Or maybe an engineer if you wanna be the redheaded stepchild, right? Sure, sure. Okay. Yeah, engineer should be, is acceptable, right? Yeah. And I pursued a very different career in business and entrepreneurship. My mom had no idea what that was even, right? To, to start your own thing, it's not a thing in Korea. No. And I realized that as I was on my way up, that when I would share something to her, it was never good enough. Yeah, and it was because she we spoke a very different language in that mm -hmm. in that sense. So for her, even today, she's telling me, "Oh, you would have been a great lawyer if you went back to school. Mm -hmm. You should go back to school." And it's never something that she can embrace. Have you ever just looked at her and said, "Well, you would have been a good mom if you"? And of course you would never say that to your mom because it's disrespectful, mm -hmm. but it's the same vibe that she's throwing on you, yet she's doing it for what reason? Love. She does it because she loves you and she doesn't know any better. Yeah, totally. Did it feel like that before you went through 40 years of Zen? To be honest, I didn't even realize that's what caused imposter syndrome. So yeah. when I've realized that on the first day, then I had to go deeper into it, right? Mm -hmm. We had to go back to the pods think about it, which is the hardest part. Cause like, you don't want to think, yeah. humans are not naturally wired to think about the negative experiences, yeah. which is why this is so powerful. And that's when I really uncovered a lot of these things about myself and my relationship with my mom. Um, yeah. What you ultimately realize, by the way, everyone who goes to 40 years of Zen does some work on mom and dad. Even if you had the most perfect parents, there was a time probably when you were about a year old where your mom, if you were a nurse, your mom's like, you have bit my nipple enough times. Hmm. Like you're done nursing. Okay, and you're a little baby, you're one years old, you don't know what the heck is going on in the world. And you're like, I'm screaming and I didn't get what I wanted. And if that day your mom's like, for God's sake, right? Maybe that was something. And you don't remember this, hmm. at least not right away. And maybe it left a mark. So your parents didn't do anything wrong and your parents always do their best. But the story that mother nature wants us to have is that our parents were perfect. Mm. Because when you're three years old and you're entirely dependent on your parents for survival, you feel best believing they're perfect. And then you keep that picture. So anything they do cannot be questioned. And what happens now, ideally, is that you can look at your parents and you can love them more deeply and authentically than before. And when she says those things like that, you can just say, I love you too, mom. Mm. 
mm. instead of like, I'm gonna be something someday. Yeah. Right? And it, it, it's funny, it happens, all of us get it and different cultures have slightly different things, but it seems like what you've got is, it's kind of the same because my friends from China, my friends from India, mm. um, from from Singapore, I, I hear this a lot. Like it, it's, it, I don't know, maybe it's, I don't know if Japan is the same way, but. It should be similar. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but uh, there was another spiritual experience that we had in there Ooh. where the we had two girls in there. Obviously, I won't show their names, but one of them had this vision, almost a psychedelic experience mm -hmm. in one of the pod sessions. And she would have this vision of these two medical doctors with a, mm. I think maybe you've heard of it, but there was no, a- I didn't hear about this one, but I'm, I'm betting into it is. Yeah, so she was like, she had this like black liquid that was coming out of her and she, was, she wasn't afraid or anything like that. But what happened was she had this vision of the other girl and in her vision, she was dealing with all of these demons in this pod session with all these dark spirits, with bats, even seeing her like defend these knights with like spears trying to go mm -hmm. in her. And she entered this pod and she didn't think much of it. Literally five minutes later, when we got together, she didn't share this experience, but the other girl <laughs> talked about this scary psychedelic experience of this, you know, bats and a spear. Like she described mm -hmm. the spear stabbing her. There was no communication both between those two at all, but when in the same pod session saw what was happening and like, I just, I couldn't believe it, but like <laughs> knowing all of the conversations that we had with them, I was like, wow, what, how can you explain something like that? And cause I'm still blown away. Obviously people oh. listening, I, you know. It, you can explain it via quantum inner connectivity between people. And I sort of don't like the word quantum because it just gets so overused and you can get a, quantum computer. So I'm pretty sure quantum is a real thing because it works to solve problems in a new way. And we know that our bodies are quantum systems because every time your heart beats, the proton spin throughout your brain changes direction with each heartbeat. Mm. We just figured this out about two years ago. And this yeah. is proof positive that we really are quantum. So everything that we see around us is a user interface to the quantum reality that we actually live in. And it's constructed by our body. So our puny little minds can hang on to things. I mean, even this wall, it's provably almost not there. If you look at the amount of space between all the little parts of the atoms that are in it, it's almost all space. But we perceive it that way. It's not that way. And why do we perceive it that way? Because we're sitting in these meat suits and the meat suits have sensor limitations, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things they can do is they can communicate. It turns out, what you experienced, you experienced that for the first time. Um, people who are trained in some of the ancient lineages or people who just naturally have that, they do this all the time. Uh, one of my teachers, he walks into a room and he's like Neo in the Matrix. He looks at every single person and he sees uh, essentially what, what's going on with them. And he can like start working on it, right? And these skills can be taught. Some people have it in their in their DNA and their lineage where they can do certain things more easily than others. But there are absolutely people who can heal you when they're across the room from you or they're across the planet from you. Mm. And I didn't used to believe that, any of this stuff. I'm a computer science guy. But if you believe in data <laughs> and you believe in science, what you saw was a relatively mild example. Yeah. Um, I had one thing years ago when I was learning, I've, I've done initiatory shamanic training. I'm not a shaman. Shamans take about eight years to form um, or to, to do all their training. Um, but someone really close to me who sees dead people all the time uh, said, that's weird. You have something stuck in your body somewhere. And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, it's under a full moon. And, and she described it in great detail. I kind of forgot about it. And she's like, I can't make it budge. I said, whatever. I don't see anything, you know. <laughs> well, about five years later, um, I was seeing a shaman. In fact, I wrote Smarter, no, what book was that? That was Fast This Way, my book on fasting. I fasted for four days in a cave. A shaman dropped me off. And I'm sitting in her living room and she goes, she looks at me and she goes, there's something stuck in your body. And she describes it with the exact same words I heard five years before. 
Oh, wow. Different person. Different person. Doesn't even know the first person. Exact same description. And she goes, I can't budget. Same as the first person. She goes, but I know who can. So a few months later, the guy who can, who's a 28th generation Siberian shaman with a beard down to his knees, uh, shakes his rattle and does a weird ceremony and tells me this long story about what it is. And the thing was gone. And the people who could see the thing said, oh, yeah, it's gone. Cool. I don't think that was random because how did they both know the same thing? It mm. couldn't even be. But what was even scarier on that one trip, actually it's not scary, it's awesome, but it's surprising is a yeah. better word. This, uh, the shaman dropped me off in a cave and it wasn't the cave I wanted to go to at the time because I went there to experience loneliness and there was someone else also meditating in the same cave. And so each morning we would turn our phone on for one minute to get a text message that just to say we were okay and then turn it off. So I turned my phone on after the first night and there's a text message that says, you're thinking about going to the other cave. Uh, so pack up your stuff. I'm getting you in an hour. And I'm like, Who's the text message from? It was from the shaman. She read my dreams. I hadn't communicated with her at all. And she knew that I was thinking about going to the other cave. I'd even thought about walking to the other cave just by myself. I didn't know where it was, but that was, I was like, whatever. She knew I was going to do it. You don't think it was like your nonverbal expression she, saying like, she was, oh. she was 15 miles away at home. Oh, she wasn't even there. She wasn't there. No, she oh, dropped I me see. off and I'm there in a cave with no communications. Mm. And the, I turn on my phone. It says, you're thinking about walking to the other cave. I'm like, how did she know? Right. And she also, I mean, she saw other things like that. So there are people who can remote view. That's so interesting. And, yeah. and at this point, the yogic cities are a list of almost 50 things that humans are capable of when they do meditation, when they have specific, um, they call them attainments on the path to enlightenment. Mm. And one of them is reading people's minds. Another one is kind of medical clairvoyance. And I have another person I know who, um, who looked at a friend and said, she's got a gray fuzz on her left breast. And I'm like, Okay, but I trust this person. Um, she's a healer. And so I told my friend, hey, I'm, I'm going to get you a whole body MRI. Like just, I don't want you to go experience that. So yeah. it's a gift. And friend went, sure enough, they found no <laughs> way. stage one. Cut it out. Everyone's fine. How? It's... Well, your hardware, the body you sit in has a bunch of things it can do that you don't know about. Yeah. Right, and why would it ever show them to you? Because your body's core desire is make sure nothing eats you, make sure you eat everything edible so you don't starve to death, and then make sure you screw everything else to make sure there's lots of babies. Hmm. Like that pretty much describes everything that you've ever done that you wish you hadn't have done, right? You you, you didn't take an opportunity because you're afraid, right? And a lot of the things we do around fear and shame and things like that. And then you ate all the Ben and Jerry's and then you went out on that date with those four women that you know you shouldn't have gone out with or whatever, you know. And each of these things, like, oh, wait, that was my body just doing what it does. And the part that you just are not your body is a really important understanding to make humans much happier. Mm. And it's very easy to prove that you're not your body. How? Well, right now, you're breathing. You ate and you drank something. There are little bits of your skin falling off right now. Thankfully, I can't see them and you can't see mine, but we know it's happening. Mm. So in reality, all the cells in your body get replaced about every 7 to 12 years. All of them. All of them, really? Yeah. So what you really are is a hollow tube of matter slowly moving through air and food. And the air and food comes in, becomes a part of you for a little while, and then leaves. So the body you have now is different than the body from 10 seconds ago. It, mm. It's like the old story of if you have a ship, like a pirate ship, and every part of the ship has been replaced, is it still the same ship? Same one, right, right. Right? Well, your yeah. body is the same way. Mm. And that raises all these existential questions. But one of the reasons 40 Years of Zen works is it's based on ancient lineages, ancient teachings. But we use neuroscience to help you get into the states much more quickly than they could teach you in the old days. And one of the things that that pops up is if I clap my hands right now, you know that it takes a certain amount of time for the sound to hit your ears and then you hear it, right? But if we have electrodes hooked up to your head, we can measure it. And an average person, it takes about a third of a second. 
before your brain gets any little electrical signal that a sound happened. And you didn't sense that there was a third of a second delay. No. It's because your brain erased it because it wasn't convenient for you to know about the delay. But during that third of a second, your brain decided, sorry, let me just say that again. During that third of a second, your body, this fully distributed consciousness inside your body decided whether it was worth letting your brain know that there was a clap. Mm. So what, you mean my body's filtering reality all the time and choosing what to let me see and not see? Yeah, it's doing that. And it's super weird, but we can show in the timing that that happens. And if you do enough 40 years of Zen, you can probably have a young person's brain again, where it takes about 240 milliseconds, about a quarter second. So I still have the brain of an 18 year old because I sense finer slices of reality because I spent a lot of time training my brain. How do you, how do you measure that, too. by the way? It's called P300D or okay. evoked potential. You measure it with EEG. Okay. We didn't do that at the 40 years of Zen, right? No, okay. it's it's on my list of things to do. Okay, got yeah. it, got it. Yeah, that makes sense. So it's it's really going through the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Like we have the, the security, the food, you know, our, our physical needs met, and it's what allows us to tap into the self-actualization, which is why you have like a private chef in the 40 years of Zen, or you're at this awesome place. So we don't have to worry about those things and tap into this next frequency of our brains. Well, for you to do what you did at 40 years of Zen, your body had to feel some things, even if your mind didn't. It needed to feel safe. So why do you think the pods are shaped like that? I thought it was like some sort of a cocoon. It was really expensive to get custom made fiberglass pods to sit and do it in. It's shaped like a womb. Mm. So you know that you're held and you're supported, right? And you don't have to know that, but your body's like, I know this, this is when it was good. So oh, then- that's interesting, yeah. Then you're, you're, you physiologically relax a little bit, Yeah. right? And then you go from there, you need to feel nourished. So we got the first one, fear, you're protected and held, and then you're fed by an executive chef, the highest quality food with enough calories, all the nutrients. So fear of food, the third F word in the, bio, the biohacking hierarchy that our body processes before reality, fear of food, what else does all life have to do to stay around forever? Friends? It's an F word. Uh, you don't do this with your friends. Oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> fertility. You want me to say it? <laughs> yeah, fertility is where I was going. But yes, yes, It's your sorry. show. You can drop it. No, no PG rating here. <laughs> <laughs> Just <So>. say it. <laughs> Usually people drop an F bomb. But yeah, yeah, fear of food, fertility. Um, in order is what the body cares about. And it would be inappropriate for me to supply that for you at 40 years of Zen. But uh, what what I do talk about in, in some of the teachings there, I'm not every time, is that if you're getting stuck and you're really working on getting into these exalted states and your brain just won't go, all you have to do is sit there and have a fantasy, right? And then, oh, look at my brain waves, bong, 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 the sounds go up, right, right. right? Because you're basically unlocking that third F word, even though you're not actually doing anything. Mm. And then the F word after that is friends. So in, in all life forms, we protect ourselves, right? Then we make sure we're nourished. Then we make sure we reproduce. And then we serve our community and the world around us. Mm. And it kind of maps to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but this is the biohacking F words. And the F word that comes after that is forgiveness, which is a part of the 40 years in practice. And what this means is after you've started taking care of your community, then you start realizing that you can let go. And what that leads to is right back to Maslow's final writings that were never published. Hmm. You talked about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You, know, you need security, you need, you need shelter and safety and love and all that stuff and food. He died in his 60s unexpectedly and his last writings on it were never published. But the final step on the hierarchy was transcendence, that we need that as much as we need shelter and safety. And I'm just packing as much transcendence into five days at 40 years of Zen as I can mm. because the feeling of lightness that I have and that people who go through the program have, it makes everything around you that used to feel big, it makes it feel small. So now Everest is not Everest anymore. It's going to be a hike, but you can do it. And it means the relationship where someone's going to say something and it hurts so much that you were going to tell them to go screw themselves even if you love them or you were going to hide or, or hit them. I mean, people do all sorts of things, right? Just to avoid the pain. But like, actually, <laughs> there's no pain left anymore. Mm. It, it can go from being infuriating when someone acts that way to being comical. And you're like, oh my gosh, like, look at what that person's doing. 
Like they're losing their mind over getting in front of me on the freeway. Mm. Like I'm just gonna pretend like they're on the way to the hospital, right? And if you have a sense of humor, you're like they're on the way to the hospital because they have projectile diarrhea. Or <laughs> maybe if you wanna be enlightened about it, they're on the way to visit, see the birth of their daughter. It doesn't sure, really matter. Sure, yeah. Either one, you're like, why don't you just cut in front of me and I'm okay. But there was a time in my life where you know, I didn't have that many muscles because I was pretty fat, but the muscles on my middle finger were really good. For <laughs> and, you know, I, I just don't, I don't sit in that anymore. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and what, what I want people to understand is you don't have to do 40 years of Zen. It's just the most efficient way that I know of. And I write about how to do the reset process, uh, even if you don't have neurofeedback. Can you go over some of that? Because I want, sure. I want to make sure this is useful. Not everyone's going to go through the 40 years of Zen and... I want something as a takeaway that people can do sure. at home. And there's definitely instructions on DaveAsprey.com, and the book is Smarter Not Harder, where I write this up, and I'm working on a more expanded version of it for you. But when you're doing the, the reset process, this is a very specific set of meditation practices. It is easier with electrodes on your brain to show you when you did it, because it's very easy to convince yourself you did it when you didn't actually do it. So the first thing you do, is you find something that triggers you. And remember, if you can be triggered, it means you're carrying a loaded gun and it means you're programmable. So that's not a state you wanna be in. And I don't care if it's your mom who triggers you or if it's your boss or you know some presidential candidate, for God's sake. Like That's like being triggered by a football team, like who cares? But people get triggered, right? In fact, I probably should have triggered someone when I said football <laughs> and politics, so there you go. Yeah. Time, to come to, time to call your therapist. But what you do is you imagine the situation and there's gonna be a person who offended you, who triggered you. So you sit yourself down somewhere you like, just visualize the place and have the person sit down across from you. And you're gonna say, all right, I need a referee or like a judge, something uh, that is outside of you that you can double check with. And the reason you do this is because your body or your ego is really good at tricking you. So usually people will pick uh, some kind of uh, deity. It, this cannot be a person like a Mother Teresa or someone. It has to be, you know, it can be God. It can be an infallible light bulb. It can be, uh, you know, Buddha, Jesus, what, whatever. Moon. Yeah, whatever moon. feels good. It can be the moon, right? Just not a person because people do dumb stuff. <laughs> so uh, you imagine this thing and you just kind of put it up there because you're going to need to talk to it in a little while. So now you're sitting there, your eyes are closed. The person who pissed you off is across from you and you're here. And then... You sit down and you say, hey person, you did X and it made me feel this way, right? You can also talk about, and it cost me millions of dollars or it cost me my relationship or it made me feel unsafe. Um, you know, it, it caused me to be reactive. Like it really, it really hurt you. And when you say this, this is the hard part. Your body is capable of replaying any emotion you've ever felt. You can replay ecstasy right now if you know how to tap into it. You can actually replay orgasm right now if you really wanted to, and yes, you can do that. You can also replay the fear, the the lack of safety, and this is where the this is a tough meditation. It's easier with electrodes helping you, but you have to feel it just for a minute. Don't feel it for ten minutes. That's gross. Like you don't want to wallow. Orgasm in it. for ten minutes. Right? You no, know, I don't mean in the office. It's or <laughs> like anti-orgasm. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So you're like, okay, let, let's say that that it's a bully. This is a really easy one. Okay, you know, little Johnny, you know, you held me down and punched me in the face uh, when I was in fifth grade, and you know, I just I felt like I was going to die, and I had so much rage and anger, and like you know, as you say that, most people have been bullied. Like you feel it. Like you you, you get hard. So. You explain it, and then you really feel it. Ugh. And here's where the, the first really big step of the reset process happens. It's when you find gratitude. And what do you mean gratitude? Like little Johnny was holding me down and punching me in the face. Hmm. Well, what good thing came about from this? It doesn't have to be a big thing. It can be the tiniest thing ever, but your nervous system won't let you process trauma unless it got something good. It just can't find it, so you make it up. Well, little Johnny went to prison. Okay, maybe that was a good thing. It's probably a lot for little Johnny, but we do live in this era. Yeah. So it could be something like this. My parents became aware that there was bullying and then we had a meeting at the principal's office, right? Or maybe, you know, 
it hurt me a lot, but it it made me realize that I could pick myself up and keep going. Like all of those are fine. Just find some good little thing. It can even be, I'm really glad little Johnny didn't poke my eyes out. There you go. You got mm. something to be grateful for. It doesn't have to be significant. You just have to be able to have a little spark of gratitude. And we actually teach you with the brain waves that we're we're training you to do at 40 years and we're teaching you how to experience deeper and more profound gratitude than you ever have before. And after the gratitude, then you're ready to say, I forgive you, little Johnny. Except, no, you don't. You just felt pain. You felt gratitude. So instead, you step into things from little Johnny's point of view. And you realize, who bullied him? What's, what are his parents like? What do you have for breakfast? Right? Was he molested? Y you don't know. But clearly, something's wrong with little Johnny. Right? You don't know what it was. And he was acting out because someone did something bad to him. And you end up experiencing compassion for the person who you've always seen as like that little bastard if I ever see him again. Yeah. All that just melts away. And you actually feel your heart open. This is a similar to a loving kindness meditation if people have heard of that. And you feel your heart just kind of open up and then you connect. And you actually get to the point where you can literally say, you know, I forgive you, we are one, it, it's okay. Like your, your, your dad was beating you. <laughs> like you only took what you learned into school and I got this thing out of it and it hurt, but I'm done. Now, that sounds easy, right? <laughs> Except here's the thing. You're probably not really doing that. You're telling yourself you're doing that, but your little internal firewall, your ego's like, nope, I'm not gonna let you forgive that guy. He might come back and kick your ass again. So then you look up to your judge, to your extra little referee, and you go, hey, Jesus, Buddha, moon, what do you think? And if you get a thumbs up or a clear signal that you actually did it completely and it feels like it's complete, then it's complete. But quite often, you get no signal. If you get no signal, it's because y you are deceiving yourself. And this is the thing you learn when you're there, right? Yeah. Um, your powers of self-deception are legion. All of us, if you're a human, your, your body, your meat, your hardware is designed to make sure you don't see a bunch of things in the world. In fact, 99% of the world you will never see because your body blocks you. And that's useful because if you had to see everything that was irrelevant in the room, you wouldn't be able to pay attention to me, right? So it's a gift, but it's also a curse. So all we're doing is we're programming the body to see the things that we say are important. Because otherwise, the body's going to see fear, food, fucking, and maybe some friends, and it's never going to see forgiveness because it doesn't actually help you eat things, mm. right? Yep. So you're just controlling your filter on reality. That's all that you're doing at 40 years in for the first three days. The final two days is something different. That's performance tuning. Yep. It's like taking your, you know, take your Honda into the racing mechanic, and then you come out, and you're like, am I in Fast and the Furious? It says it's a Honda, but it doesn't drive like a Honda. Your brain can do that too. Yeah, let's go into that, because I think the mm. brain train optimization is the other part, that's the particular part that really interested me and yeah. probably inter interests a lot of people. I don't know how many supplements that we took throughout this whole experience, but there are supplements that I've never heard of that didn't know existed, that I didn't know how many I can swallow you know, supplements for. And mm -hmm. um, talk to me a little bit about brain train training and optimization for people sure. that may not have access to electrodes or cap training, anything mm -hmm. like that. What sure. are some big movers for helping with executive function, cognitive function, making better decisions. The most accessible brain training on the planet is breath work, meditation, and chanting. Breath work, I'm surprised by that. Hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah, what kind of breath work? It almost doesn't matter. All of the yogic techniques, all of the Qigong techniques that involve breath work, the pranayama, the art of living, holotropic breath work, uh, Wim Hof's work, which is based on ancient Tibetan practice, hmm. uh, all of these, can profoundly change your brain states. Is that getting more blood flow to the, uh, or an oxygen to the brain? Is that like a scientific thing or? Some of them can do hypoxia, which can, in, which can help you enter states like you've taken LSD. Mm -hmm. in, in very, very profound things. But others, no, that's not what it's doing. Sometimes it increases CO2 levels, mm -hmm. uh, which then can increase oxygen levels. Uh, but what you'll see is a shift in the type of brain waves. So your brain has kind of settings and it's funny on, on modern cars and all, why would you ever listen to the radio? You kind of forget about it. But right now there are companies broadcasting sounds that aren't over the internet. And then if you have some 1970s car, you could you know turn the little dial and find, well, 
your brain waves, it's still your brain, but are you on this channel or on this channel? Mm. And so you can do that and it, it makes a big difference. Yeah, it, it was fascinating to think about because we all got to see each other's brain waves and some of us had higher alpha, some of us had higher, you know, high betas. And it made me realize that that might affect the way we look at the world. And when you're thinking about um, the people that were able to see certain things that other oh, yeah. people weren't, uh, it kind of centers around like, oh, like it made visual sense to me now yeah. because of the way our brain waves work, it yeah. triggers certain things. And breath work you're saying is one of those things. Like DMT is also released yeah. with certain like Wim Hof breathing and stuff like with that. With certain kinds of, of breath work, right? right. And it's funny. I know the types of brain waves that are present in people with psychic powers. And you could say, Dave, I thought you were scientific. You're such a bro. There's no such thing as psychic powers. Uh, at which point I would just say, I think you need to do a reset process because you've lost your curiosity, hmm. right? I didn't believe there was such a thing as psychic powers till I experienced many people who could do things they should not be able to do to the point that it's obvious. And no, they're not all mentalists and stuff like that. And when you have direct experience of things like that, you go, oh, wait a minute. And then you find out that the vast majority of exceptionally wealthy families work with psychics. And you find 75 years of public records showing that our three-letter agencies work with psychics. And you become really good friends with people who are written about in universities as you know, the best remote viewers on the planet. Like, you know what, maybe they're all crazy or maybe there's something to this. And then the fact that brains that look a certain way hmm. are highly associated with people who see things. And when you have that one friend who's like, man, I see a whatever spirits all around all the time, they just see different things than you. They're not crazy and you're not crazy. <coughs> so breath work can change the station of your brain. And that can help you focus. And breath work is more powerful than just meditation. Hmm. Um, so the combination is powerful. And then there are a variety of, of kind of at home technologies. There's like brain tap, um, there's other home EEG machines, most of which I'm not a fan of uh, because they actually can put your brain in the wrong state. If you think about this, in every tribe of say, 150 people you know, back in Africa when we were evolving, you would want to have some specialization. So we know that 15% of people stay up late naturally just in case there's a lion, right? That's the night, the night watch. And 15% of people wake up really stupidly early. That's the morning watch. And 15% of people never sleep well. They're the backup alarms. And then the other 50, 60% of people, they have keep normal hours and they're the people who get stuff done. So we just naturally still follow these percentages. Wouldn't it also make sense that some percentage of people would be more intuitive than others? Some would be better at thinking, some would be better at fighting, would be better at defending versus farming. Well, it turns out some percentage of people, who knows what it is, 10, 10 would be a good guess. When there's a fire or an explosion, most healthy humans run away. And there's a percentage of people who are like, I'm in, and then they run towards it. And sometimes they get called heroes, but when you talk to them, they don't think they're heroes. They're just doing what was right. It's because it's in their blood. If you take someone who runs towards a fight to fix a problem, and you make them do a meditation that was for a farmer when they're a hunter, it is painful and debilitating. Mm. Right. So do you want to use a home EEG device <laughs> without knowing whether you're a hunter or a farmer? Right. You might not want to do that. Even when you were at 40 years of Zen, we were calculating a unique peak state for you and training you to that state, and it was different than others. Mm. And that's why I'm a little skeptical uh, from, from some of the home EEG machines. I bought they're my not personalized, right? They're not personalized. And I bought my first EEG machine for using at home 25 years ago. And wow. after a little while, I realized doing brain surgery on yourself is probably a bad idea because if you break your brain, you can't fix it because you just broke the part you needed to fix it. So that's why I opened 40 Years of Zen 11 years ago. Yep. I, I actually need racing car mechanics to work on my brain so that I can do the things I want to do. And mm. in that time, you know, I built a $100 million a year company. I have two amazing children. 
I've started six other companies. I've written four New York Times bestsellers and four other books with almost a million copies and 400 million downloads of my podcast, run the world's largest biohacking conference, including the one in Dallas, yeah. biohackingconference.com, end of May. And probably a bunch of other stuff. Oh, Upgrade Labs, my big franchise company. We have 27 locations opening where you can come in and do the neurofeedback from 40 years of Zen, just 30 minute mm. sessions. Yep. You're not gonna do the whole reset and all that, but we can get you into advanced states and we're opening that 27 locations. I did all that and I have a life. Right? Oh, and I reversed my age <laughs> and I age at 72% the, the rate of normal and built a regenerative farm on 32 acres with sheep and pigs and cows. And Am I bragging? I, I don't think so. I'm just saying, how did I do all that? I was a fat computer hacker with Asperger's syndrome and ADHD. Mm. Like, like if anyone on earth should have not done all that, it was me, right? And I think it's because I built a racing car mechanic system for my brain at 40 years of Zen. And now the mission is to let people know about it. We're enhancing the program in multiple ways. And we also, in the coming months, will be announcing ketamine-assisted neurofeedback there. Oh, talk to me about that. Yeah, because I know you yeah. experimented with mm -hmm. that yourself quite recently. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've used most of the psychedelics um, ceremonially or medicinally yeah. um, more than once. We'll put it that way. I go to Burning Man, for God's sake. <laughs> so yeah, at 40 years, and we'll be announcing more details about that, but that'll be available soon. Okay. And um, there's multiple reasons for doing it. But what I want to do is I want to pack every minute of time at 40 years in with the things that cause the most profound and long lasting state change in your brain. So that you walk out of there with the biggest upgrade you could cram into five days. And you felt pretty busy when you were there, right? Mm. Like every minute is accounted for. It's because I'm honored that you're taking five days to be there. The first three days, we're going to help you stop wasting energy in your brain. Right, so every time you stop being triggered by something, the amount of energy that goes into monitoring for the trigger goes into improving you. Mm. So your net wasted energy drops. It's like getting a 30 or 40% power boost in your brain, that's why everything feels easier. And then the last two days is the performance tuning, where we're saying, oh, look at that, this part of the brain doesn't talk to this part of the brain very effectively at one of the, we'll call it a musical note, at one of the frequencies. So we're just gonna train that up a little bit. And we'll do the same thing over here to go down. And we're training complex networks in the brain based on advanced math. And do you notice how tired you were when you finished that training? Yeah, I was exhausted. Okay, so you're sitting there and you're looking at a picture of your brain and you're hearing like doo -doo 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 -doo, and looking at a little light slide up. And after 10 minutes, you're like, what is going on? <laughs> and what it is is your brain, not you, but your brain, your not conscious parts, is going, oh my God. And it's, a, it's like turning its knobs and dials and rewiring. And then you walk out of there going, I need to eat. Like, I'm so hungry. Mm. And your brain's like, give me more energy. I need, to, I need to do this work. And it's the same thing as if you take your, I did this to my F-150. When I lived on the farm up on uh, Vancouver Island, I couldn't really buy a Tesla because I lived on a farm and the neighbors would have made fun of me. So I bought an F-150. And I took it in, I put it on the exhaust and I got the chip and it sounded like a Ferrari, which was kind of embarrassing. Um, but you just press a button on the chip and the sound would change and all the computer system would change huh. and you'd have 50 additional horsepower, right? Just by tuning it right. Your brain's the same way. Yeah, it's a good analogy. So that's what we're doing on those last two days. Yeah. The combination of wasting less energy and then having much higher efficiency in your tuning, mm. man, every time I do it, and I, like I said, six months of that, it was like 24 times going through the program, yep. Yep. Uh, I, I get new insights. And after your first time through, the second time we actually take you to slightly different states. So each time is a deeper journey into different levels. And pretty soon you get into the levels of just knowing. Mm. And this is something that I'm, I'm just starting to teach to some of the, some of the classes uh, when people are coming to 40 Years of Zen. It's, there's an order of operations of reality that, that you probably wouldn't see. When you walk into a room, when something happens, your body immediately knows reality, okay? That's intuition. And right afterwards, almost on top of it, there's an emotion and this is your body's firewall it's saying oh, okay i knew reality but then it feels a certain way so it's first is intuition then is feelings 
and then is thinking. Mm. And what we learn, the more critical our parents are, the more we're in a Western style school, we learn to, there's no such thing as intuition. They teach us that's not true, even though it's very, very provable. Just, that's why Joe Dispenza is speaking at my conference. The science around this is crazy. So they teach you there's no intuition, and then they teach you to ignore emotion because emotion is almost always based on trauma if it's negative emotion, and so all that's left is thinking. Thinking takes energy, it's really slow, and it throws away 99% of the data. And then you hang your hat on the thinking, and then you move forward. Mm. Well, once you do the work at 40 years of Zen, or some of these other spiritual practices, you realize there's the immediate intuition feeling, then there's then there's emotional kind of garbage feelings, there's, there, there's stuff, but if they're negative feelings, it's all programming. And then there's a thought about it. And why are, we, why are we using the feelings to make up a thought? An example, someone cuts you off in traffic, it felt irritating. So then the story is that person cut me off in traffic because they think they're better than me, mm. right? And so then you're gonna believe that because of the feeling. But if you have this process called a metacognition or meta-awareness, this is a little, a little thing that's always just watching how you think, just being curious. What's going on in there? You realize, wait a minute, when that person walked in the room, I felt it somewhere in my body. Either this is, a, this, like, I'm, I'm drawn to this person or this isn't safe, right? And you know, and then right away there's an emotion and then there's a story. And the number of times that we ignore our intuition because we confused it with the emotion or we overweight the emotion um, or we ignore all of that and we just do what the brain says, knowing full well it's going to be a disaster, you do yeah. it anyway. Right. It's because we don't trust our intuition enough. It's because you can train your intuition. And people who go through 40 years of Zen, uh, in my experience, they become aware of that beautiful little time, that little, little secret window of intuition. And you can train intuition to be stronger. And it's mm. been a huge thing for me. Um, recently... Someone reached out and said, Dave, can you come to this thing in Austin? And I want you to meet some, some you know, business leaders. I get paid $100,000 to speak at events on a regular basis. I fly over the world uh, and I'm, I've got a very packed schedule. Yeah. But my intuition was just lighting up. Like, you got to say yes. I actually canceled a trip to LA and, and actually I pissed off my PR team by doing that. But I just knew I needed to go there. And I go there and I'm chatting with some really cool people I, I liked getting to know in Austin. And one of them said, I have a company for you to meet. And uh, I'm actually going to acquire that company. <laughs> That's how it happened. Wow. <laughs> I followed my intuition. I have no idea why I went to that, except I know the feeling of my intuition because I trained it. Yeah. I could not have told you why I went there. My team's like, what is going on? This isn't an important event. Like, you know, you're turning down something. Yeah, this, is, this was actually a really big deal. And it, it was something that I actually was looking for. So yeah. did I manufacture that? Did it just happen? Am I making up a story about the whole thing? I actually don't care. My intuition led me there and it worked. <laughs> and what is it? Is it just about being more aware of it, of your intuitions, that spidey sense feeling and listening to it, letting it build up over time? How do you really train intuition mm -hmm. without all of the tools that we have that anyone can do? Well, I have a podcast uh, with a friend. Um, her name is Joy Martina. The whole thing is about how do you train your intuition? Mm. And she had some really interesting things. Any meditation practice will help you be more intuitive. It doesn't even matter which one, right? All you're doing with meditation at the very highest level is you're learning how to pay attention to what's going on in there. And eventually learn how to change what's going on in there. But a lot of practices like TM or some of the Buddhist things, allow the thoughts to arise, let them wash through you, recognize that you are not your thoughts. And when I hear that now, I'm like, eh. <laughs> Gross, except it's really valuable and I've practiced that for years. Yeah. What I realize now is that if I have inappropriate emotions that are not the kinds that I want, well, they're there to keep my body safe, but they're not necessary. So that means if I'm feeling all these you know, strong negative emotions about something, it means I have uncured trauma. It, it means that my, my alarm systems are getting turned on for no reason. Like imagine if we were recording this and the smoke detector just kept going off with no smoke all the time. Yeah. It would drive you crazy. Mm -hmm. Well, every time you get triggered, even by things you don't even know are triggering for you, right? then it's the same thing. Mm. So instead of letting the emotions wash through me, 
You go, that's weird. I wonder where that one came from. And then my body has learned to say, oh, that actually came from this thing you haven't thought about in 10 years or 20 years. Oh, that's weird. And I write it down on a list. And then I run a reset process on it whenever I'm near some 40 years in gear, which is in my living room. Right? So then yeah. I have this practice of continuously letting go as much as I can. And it's only when I don't have awareness that I'm being triggered that I get stuck. And the more you let go, the more you're curious about what's happening, the more you monitor what's happening, you start to notice, wait, first I felt this, then I felt this. Which one was first? Training intuition is a matter of learning how to see what happened first, even though it's just a little bit. If you were to draw a graph, it's like 10%. At the very first 10% it was intuition, then there was this huge emotion after that. Fuck the emotion. Mm. What did the intuition say? That's where the knowingness is. And when you tap into knowingness, you find that you already know the answer to the problem before you thought about it. And a lot of thinking is unnecessary. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, because we also create stories Mm -hmm. in order to avoid the dark thoughts or the trauma that we may have thought yeah. to process it. And then that's, that's another thing that I've learned as well is that there are stories that you haven't revisited in years, sometimes decades from childhood. And when you really dig deeper into what happened, whether it's with your parents or a breakup, you realize that these are somewhat like either fake or exaggerated stories that made you have these negative feelings. And oh, yeah. a lot of them are not true, right? They're, the feelings are real, but the story is complete BS. Yeah. Like I, I, I can share one of those and it's, it's kind of funny in retrospect, but about 10 years ago, I went on the Joe Rogan show three times and it changed his life. He was just effusive, just so much praise. Like, oh my God, Bulletproof Coffee, Dave Asprey, grass-fed meat. You know, his blog has all this content. Like, it's so good. And I didn't know who Joe Rogan was. Like, I was doing my own show. I had actually never listened to a podcast. Really? Until last year, I, I've listened to maybe six podcast episodes in my life. Like, I, it's just, Okay, you weren't just a big podcast. It, yeah. I just, I, I create content. I, I don't spend time listening to it like that. Um, I listen to audiobooks because they're just more concentrated. So anyway, I didn't know who Rogan was, but he was already a big deal. And I went on a show and I just talked about what I do. And uh, he ended up inviting me back and inviting me back. And then pretty soon, um, one of the companies that he was an investor in decides to copy my products, like just straight up copy them. So overnight, he tells his followers, Dave Asprey's a bad man. And he lied on my show, despite there being no evidence. He says my coffee's moldy. There's no evidence. And I, was, I know which company this is. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was a big takedown campaign, right? And sure. it was orchestrated. It was a cancellation thing. Like uh, the whole thing, you know, I, and, I, and I'll just say straight up, uh, I've been to Joe's comedy show. It's funny. He's actually a really funny guy. Uh, and what he did during the pandemic, like kudos, real balls. I have no issues with that stuff. What he did with me was dirty. Okay, you know, he's an MMA guy. We're in business, um, but it was dirty. So what I should have just done was was looked at reality, which was very different than what I saw. Because what I saw was I walked in, I did nothing but help Rogan and all of his fans. Like I offered them new knowledge, new information. I was authentic. Every single thing I said was real and true. Yet I got punished for it. And I didn't know this. It took about six months to figure it out. And it really rocked me from a business perspective. Mm. Um, it was injustice. Injustice is a major trigger for people because we believe life is fair. It's not. And I was like, I got to do something. So you plug in the electrodes, go back. I got to do a reset on this. One of, my, uh, one of my guys, the first head of marketing I had was a convoy commander from Iraq. His name is Zach. And he's like, Dave, why are you acting this way? Like you got some douchebag comedian who's you know saying bad things about you online. I'm like, but have you seen the comments? You know, people used to say thanks for helping me lose 100 pounds, and now they're just saying you know that I sell uh, snake oil. And so I went and I hooked the electrodes up and I started doing the reset process. And this image popped into my mind that I hadn't thought of in th 30 or 40 years. I was in first grade, um, and I went to the bathroom in first grade at my public school, and there's a kid peeing on the wall. Right, so I walk out of the bathroom and I say, "Teacher, teacher, you know the kid peed on the wall." Uh, why am I telling you this right now? My stupid body remembered this, right? And he comes out and goes, "It wasn't me. It was Dave." So I got punished. I got sent to the principal's office. And the amount of outrage in a first grader for being punished for doing the right thing—it apparently really pissed me off back then. Mm -hmm. I had no recollection of this in my adult life. But as soon as I started doing the work, it popped into my head. Like, what the hell? 
So you do the reset on the teacher and you do the reset on you know the other kid. One for lying and one for not believing me, right? And as soon as I did that, reality just came tumbling in. And the reality was every time Joe Rogan says Dave Asprey is a bad person, I make more money because I sell more coffee. It doesn't matter what he says. But I was completely like rocked for about six months hmm. because of an old trauma from first grade that I had no conscious recollection from. And now, I like to think I'm kind of a badass. I've done enormous things in the world. Uh, I also know that I have all of my flaws and all that stuff. But if some dumb experience I can't remember from first grade can rock me in my business world for six months, that's unacceptable, right? So I healed that trauma. I ran the reset process on it. And now, last time I went to see a Rogan comedy show, I wore a bulletproof t-shirt. Hmm. What a message. Yeah, mm -hmm. there, there's, no, there's no anger there, right? There's no trauma. Otherwise, I'd be really pissed off. Yeah, yeah. Interesting, wow. So what experiences in your life that you can't even remember are making you feel unsafe right now or making you feel like you're not enough? It turns out there's a lot. And this is science. This is biohacking. This isn't at all in the land of woo-woo. This is, oh, you do what I'm talking about. We can measure the changes in your brain. It's quantifiable. And the reported experience of those changes are, I have more energy, I'm happier, I'm not anxious anymore, I can sit down with a family dinner and I'm not triggered by my parents anymore, I feel more love, my relationships are healed, I'm a better leader, I'm more creative, I'm more intuitive, I'm connected to my body, I no longer wake up with night terrors, all kinds of stuff. None of this is because there's something wrong with us, it's because our dumb meat hardware is running ancient programming to make sure tigers don't eat you. And mm. your mom's not a tiger, it just doesn't know that. So once you clean up all the mess in your programming, you realize, oh my God, this hardware has superpowers. Mm. It just knows stuff. And if I just pay attention to it, then I'll just know stuff. And then, wait, if it just knows stuff, if I'm paying attention, can I also do stuff? Yeah. Can I perceive things I couldn't perceive before? Yeah. Can I learn how to heal people? Yeah. You can. Can you learn how to heal people across the planet? Yes, you can. Mm. Now here you can be like, Dave, what are you talking about? You just ran, ran off the deep end again. One of the reasons I invited Dr. Joe Dispenza to speak at my biohacking conference um, at May 30th, 31st, June 1st in Dallas is because he's been doing really rigorous scientific analysis of healing comparing what happens when eight people go into meditative states and do healing work on someone to pharmaceutical drugs, and he's beating the drugs with meditation. Wow. Including remote healing. There is data and science to back this up. Or you could read some of the old yoga sutras where they describe the same damn thing. He's just using numbers to prove what we've known for 5,000 years. Right, he's using language that I guess the logical minds yeah. of other people can more, relate more to. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we're proving stuff that we already knew. Or you could do something um, that comes from an ancient Chinese lineage. I did this 20 something years ago. A guy was teaching how to, heal, how to heal people. He's like, this is from my family. I'm the 28th generation. I don't know why I have so many 28th generations in my stories. <laughs> I swear to God, they're all 28. Yeah, yeah they're all 28, I, Dave. I don't get it, if that, that's, these are both real numbers. Yeah. Uh, one, one guy's name is Jade Gr uh, Grigori, mm. uh, and he, he really was, but whatever. Um, when, uh, now I wonder about 28, because like, why are both of them 28th? That's weird. Um, but um, this guy taught you know, how to manipulate other people's energy fields. He's like, my family's done it forever. There's no secret to it. It's just a skill people have. Just mm. no one knew about it. Yeah. And like, this sounds like a bunch of BS until you practice it. Go, oh. You can do it, right? So you also could say, how about you change the shape of the field around your heart? Think you can do that? Yeah. Um, you can. And you can breathe into your heart. You can do that. One of the technologies that I've worked with is heart rate variability training. And when you learn how to do this right, you can change the... You can change the spacing of your heartbeat and the size of the magnetic field around your heart. And we know that our brains, let me change that. 
And we know that our hearts will entrain to the largest, most powerful, most coherent heartbeat around us. Mm. And that means when I go on stage for Tony Robbins or someone, do I take 10 seconds before I do it? And do I turn on my maximum power heart field that is grounded and calm and focused? And when I walk out on stage and people say, he feels authentic. What it, they mean is they can connect with me because I'm radiating in a very specific way that is teachable and trainable. Mm. Are there any routines that you go through when you're about to go to somewhere that needs to be a high performance state, whether mm. you're speaking at the biohacking conference, whether you're doing an important podcast, let's say you get invited to Joe Rogan again <laughs> in full <laughs> circle, so <laughs> you know, you never know, you never know. And, uh, you know, you really need to be performing. What, what are some of the routines, uh, maybe even affirmations, we were taught affirmations as well, mm -hmm. that you tell yourself that could benefit other people that are also listening, that can maybe mimic some of the things that have worked for you? One of the things that works really well is, I'll use a whole body vibration platform. And people are like, are you serious, Dave? I'm like, yeah, NASA uses them to cure astronauts. I've been writing about these in the world of biohacking for a dozen years now. So I'll put them behind stage. You stand on it for a minute, your whole body vibrates 30 times a second and it activates your chi. You can also just jump up and down. Tony so, Robbins uses a rebounder. Right. It's kind of shake, if not, you could just shake it out a little bit like this. Mm. You're just activating energy meridians. And yes, those are real things. You can measure them now. Acupuncturists have known about them for longer than we could measure them. And it activates ones that go up here. That helps. You can take a deep abdominal breath through your nose and let it out slowly through your nose. You can do an ujjayi breath when you do that. Ujjayi is a yogic term, uh, which is when it sounds like a seashell. It's almost like you're snoring. Hmm. So it's like. And it's right on the edge of just pulling off a snore. And try doing five of those when you're going to sleep at night and you'll be out. What does that do exactly? What, what is that type of breathing? It shifts the state of your brain really dramatically. It drops into your body. Mm. And there are specific, they're probably more advanced than I could teach right now. There are specific grounding techniques. You can learn to be enormously grounded. Mm. Um, and they'll teach this in martial arts and yoga, qigong, uh, and even in shamanic practice. So you can just be glued to the earth. You can be connected to the sky, all those mm. things. I didn't believe any of this stuff. I just learned how yeah. to do it. And neurofeedback is at the core. And what you realize is most of us, we find a practice and then that becomes, we have a guru and we sort of follow that practice. Like I do TM, I do art of living, which is one of my favorite kinds of breathing. Um, Sri Sri uh, Ravi Shankar has like 50 million followers in India. Wow. I did that for five years every morning. Uh, you, uh, you might say, oh, I have, you know, my favorite yoga teacher or, you know, the hugging saints or, you know, uh, Pope whoever, right? Uh, what I do, because I'm a computer hacker and I'm very cross-lineage, is I study all of it as, as much as I can. And sometimes gurus don't like that. And other times I've been very blessed that they'll reach out to me, people I don't know, and say, I see what you're doing. And like, there's a few things you should know. And I'm like, are you serious? Like, mm. Is this happening? And the reality is that we have all these, these buckets of knowledge around the planet that we've been studying, but we've been hoarding them. This is for my clan. This is for my kingdom. We're not going to let other people know about it. And we're at a time in the world where we need access to our full state of being human. And it's time for the, the lineage system to come apart so mm -hmm. that the full instruction manual for humans is available for all of us. How do you learn all this? Because I'm curious to dig into your learning acquisition strategy because you're, you're surrounded by so much information. I mean, it's crazy how much you can remember also. How have you learned to optimize your memory and your ability to learn and also remember mm -hmm. so many information that's thrown at you? Because I think the problem today, it's not information. You can type in ChatGPT, get any information that you want. It's actually being able to remember it and then apply it in our regular lives. Mm -hmm. But you seem to have done that really well. Thank you. Um. One of the things that helped me a lot is we, we panic when we're learning information. If you don't learn this information well enough, you'll get a, a B 
on your test and then mom won't love you. And it follows that if mom doesn't love you, mom won't feed you. And if mom doesn't feed you or kicks you out of the house, then a tiger will eat you. So if you can't remember this information, you'll die. This is actually what's happening inside mm. your body. Now, your body is wired so that the first thing you do is fear before you can think. So then anytime you have to recall something, it triggers fear, which means you can't think. Mm. Thinking is very slow. So what I, what I did is for five years when I was working in Silicon Valley, I had a, a very demanding job at the company that invented web hosting. We... Um, we held Google's first servers when Google was two guys and two computers. Oh, wow. We built the data centers for them. Um, a very, very successful time. And I decided I would teach the web and internet engineering program during the, the birth of the internet as we know it uh, at the University of California mm. after work. So I would, it was like running strategy and I built a, a part of this 500 person team. That it was exhausting. I mean, it was, it was exciting. Yeah. And then I would teach a three hour class and I had 90 minutes from the end of work to have dinner, to read a bunch of trade journals and then teach a class on the new evolution of technology that week. And the first time I taught, I, I failed miserably and a teacher taught me how to teach. And then I realized I could eat a sandwich and I could read and scan and take a few notes, and then I could give a three-hour lecture, drawing all the diagrams on the board. And I practiced this for five years, about three nights a week I would teach. And I, there was nothing I could prepare ahead of time because I was teaching what changed that week from the week before. Hmm. And after a little while, I realized I don't have to read everything in this article to have an understanding of the article, right? It's... Um, it's a, a way of drawing a picture of a deep knowingness. And what I was doing is I was training part of that intuition that we talked about before. Mm -hmm. Intuition is knowingness. And your body already knows what's written in, in the book. You just don't know how to let your body know because you'll feel an emotion or then you'll start thinking about it too much. So there is a little window where you can let information flow into you. And no, I'm not saying that I can put my hand on a book like Dr. Strange and, you know, do an incantation. It's not like that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like a deep curiosity and it, it's a way of connecting energetically with the material in the book. And I'm reading it, but I'm not reading every word. I'm kind of looking at it and I'm getting a sense for it and then I'm going deep here and then I'm skipping there. And are you visualizing at the same time what it, you're, what the takeaways are? It's all are? a 3D picture. Yeah. But I actually have a terrible memory. If you told me to say what I just said, I wouldn't even know what I said. But you remember like the percentages of taking this and the grams of this supplement. Yeah. And so well, what's the difference there? If you're, is well, it's, it, it's all a picture. Do you really have bad memory? Is that the story that you're telling yourself? There are some types of memory, um, especially um, auditory memory. Yeah. So I used to have Asperger's syndrome. Yeah, there's some where I, I really don't like, what did I do yesterday? I kind of need to look at my phone because I don't know what I did yesterday, yeah. truly. Mm. I, I have vague recollections. I don't really pay attention to, to time. I'm very future focused. So what happened in the past, I don't know. Why would I care? Mm. So I only remember things I care about. Everything else, I have no idea. It's almost a superpower, right? Because then you don't have to, well, you know, maybe it's a double edged. A, sure. It's a double edged sword because sure. normal human interactions, people remember a lot of stuff that I don't remember, mm. right? So I've optimized my brain call it an ADHD superpower. ADHD is the ability to pay 100% attention to things you care about. Yeah. Right? And most people, maybe if you have more of the farmer brain, pay attention to whatever's in front of you. It's okay, right? Maybe it's a potato, you know, maybe it's a grain field, whatever, like, like it's okay. And that's a yeah. super powerful, peaceful place to be. It's not my place. Mm. Like, I don't care if it's a potato. Like you cannot make me care. You can torture me and I won't care if it's a potato, right? Because it's not what I'm interested in. And when I'm interested in it, I will become one with it. And I will have a 3D picture of it in my head and I will know how it works. And that's how I do all the biology stuff. The things that I write about in my books, studies come out after I write the books. Like right. I said, C8 MCT oil works better than any other kind of MCT oil. And I hypothesized why, but I said it as a fact. Mm. And five years later, UCSD publishes a study showing, oh, that one thing that Dave recommended raises ketones way more than all the others. Right, right. Right, there's a reason for that. <clears throat> it's that, that little window of intuition, mm. right? 
And of course, when you get an intuitive hit on something, you still validate it with thinking. But most of us, we spend a lot of our energy thinking when we already knew the answer. Yeah, and it's, I guess it's also understanding your learning style. Like there's a um, saying that if you're listening to an audiobook, it's also good while you're reading it as well. For me, that's really hard to do because I usually, you usually listen faster than you read. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just triggering different parts of your brain that allows you to retain more information. Um, what are some of the other techniques that have worked for you? Let's say like an audiobook for you to remember all this information. Mm. If you listen to an audiobook the right way, you draw a picture of what's in the book all the time. And the part of your brain that does that probably isn't very exercised right now. One of the things you want to do is listen to fiction on an audiobook for 20 minutes a day. Hmm. And there are studies that show this. It doesn't matter if it's listening or if it's just reading with your eyes. But the ability to draw a picture of what's happening instead of just see words is really important. So when I read a PubMed report or something like that, all I'm doing is just drawing pictures in my head when I read it. Mm. Okay, so then that goes here, that goes here, this has to connect to that. And when I'm doing the really complex stuff, like for I, one of my books was like a, a science best-selling list for the New York Times, which is the, a very exclusive list to be on. That was my book on brain function and mitochondria. Huh. Some of the stuff, and that was just too complex to have a picture in my head. So I drew a picture. I'd like read you know, a 30 page paper and I'd just sketch it out. Okay, now I've got it. I see the steps and then I can commit it to memory because the easiest way to really learn something is to pretend like you're gonna cheat on a test <laughs> and make a cheat sheet. Right. And once you compress all that knowledge into a cheat sheet, you're gonna learn it. Mm. The other thing you could do is you could say, I'm gonna teach it. And teaching is a very powerful way to learn something. In fact, probably Thomas Edison or Mark Twain or some famous guy said something like that. If you really want to learn something, teach it. Right. So it turns out I've been teaching biohacking since before it was called biohacking. So that also has helped us cement this in my head. Right. Even your lectures, like you were learning and then you were teaching, which reinforced the, the information. Yeah. Um, how I was much? actually reading and learning and I was reading, learning, taking notes and teaching. <laughs> Just yeah. in a vicious All cycle. in a row, yeah. Yeah, Jim Quick also, doesn't he talk about like putting emotions into it if you were trying to memorize a set of numbers or fruits and having like, I don't know, imagine like a cucumber kissing a tomato and that triggers certain emotions like laughter and that allows you to remember more things. Talk to me a little bit about, mm. about that. Tim Quick is a is a memory expert. He's a, a good friend. We've known each other for more than 10 years. He's done 40 years of Zen and talked about it. And yeah, he's right. Every memory that you have in your entire brain gets looked up by emotion. Hmm. So if you have like a database on your on your email, you can look it up by who sent it. You can look at what was the subject line, you know, when was it sent? In your brain, the only thing that looks, looks up anything is what did it feel like. And so what Jim is teaching you is to say, well, you know, what's the feeling of the cucumber? And then, like, oh, I remember that, yep. right? And what, what, it, what are all the senses? How do you get all five senses involved in it? Um, I don't know that I do that. I'm thinking, how do I do it? I'm, I'm very visual in the way that I remember yeah. stuff. Maybe you're a visual learner. Um, there's also something called like an embodied learner too, mm. where I actually feel it in my gut. Wow. <laughs> and it, there's a deep knowingness in your body and most of us aren't connected. I certainly wasn't connected yeah. at all. But when you talk to an advanced meditator, like, yeah, like I, I just kind of downloaded that. Mm. And when I get into certain states, I'm... It's, it, I kind of feel like I'm like going to the cloud and grabbing some information. I'm like I just kind of think about it, right? I just I, I sort of want it, and then I just know it, mm. right? And then that was what I needed. And other times I'm like, hey, Chat GPT, and then I know that, yeah. right? Yeah. But sometimes the the quantum leaps are just to to create a new understanding. Like in my last book, the this principle called slope of the curve biology, which makes sense within all the frameworks I, I use. So the body doesn't actually respond well to the amount of work you do. It just cares about how quickly you started and how quickly you stopped and returned to baseline. Mm. And this is a major principle that, just mark my words, the vast majority of biological phenomena are controlled by that, not by the volume of work, right? And this is why in five days we can do 40 years of Zen. And this is why you come to upgrade labs and we can put muscle on 
oh, about three or five times faster than picking up rocks. And we can do cardio. I actually haven't done the math. In 15 minutes of cardio without sweating gives you six times better results than five hours of cardio. So fast. Yeah. Yeah. So this is all real stuff. It's just based on an understanding of the system of biology and the system of consciousness. Mm. Most people believe a whole bunch of assumptions about the world and about themselves that are not true. They're, they've been untested. You, you just don't know you have to do that. You just mm. believe you have to do that. And I'm thinking, I had an employee who works with me who's, who's great. And recently, uh, she was supposed to come in and grab me from a meeting to come to another meeting or, or something. I don't remember the details. And she didn't do it. And I was like, what happened? She goes, well, I was, I was told I couldn't interrupt you. I'm like, oh, that's weird. Who told you that? And she, she stops and she looks at me and she goes, um, um, um. She goes, I guess no one told me. But in her mind, she believed she had been told that because it was a program that she had in her mind. Yep. Like she had told herself that and just believed it as like a hard wall she could not see through. So she waited outside, even though she had just said she was going to come in and interrupt me. Mm. Right? Oh, yeah. It's so interesting. So this is, you know, old. Pro <clears throat> so this is, you know, old programming. Right? Yeah. But we all have that. And we realize how much of what I believe about the world has been tested. You realize you're kind of sitting on a house of cards. Yeah. And we'll, we'll, <coughs> we'll, uh, we'll, we'll close it off here because we're, we're running out of time here for you. But um, what are some of those things for you? What are some of those questions, frameworks that you've asked mm -hmm. yourself that shifted the paradigm of how you used to look at the world? that you look at now? Because you start so many businesses as well. So you, I would imagine you have to approach that as a unique way of looking at the problem that maybe other people aren't seeing and also the solution. And it's probably what makes you such a great entrepreneur. But uh, for people that are listening, curious to know what are the frameworks and the questions that you're asking that may be mm -hmm. giving you the different results that people aren't getting. It's funny that you're, uh, you're calling me a great entrepreneur. Um, there's different kinds of entrepreneurs. I, I won, I don't know if winning is the right thing. Say so Forbes awarded Bulletproof when I was running it, an award that, that said it was one of the 20 most innovative brands in the world. Right? So I'm a good innovator. Mm. I'm a good visionary. I'm a good product guy. I'm a good marketer. I'm not sure I'm a great entrepreneur. I mean, Bulletproof just sold at a you know, fire sale price. They, they kicked me off the board years ago. Um, so it wasn't a huge win for me. It was, it's changed the world. It's done really good stuff. But I know people who maybe are less public who are phenomenal operators of companies. Mm. I'm not, right? So my learning has been I can start a $100 million company, but I don't have any desire to run it. Mm. Like running big companies sucks. It's one of the most horrible things I could ever think of doing. And I know that there are people out there who love doing it, and it's their thing. So my challenge as an entrepreneur has been tapping into that intuition because there's times when I've hired people who have literally lit my companies on fire. And because I'm a visionary and an innovator, I'm like, well, can't they see all the good stuff that's going to happen? All they have to do is what they said they would do. So I was kind of naive. Like there are actually dishonest people who will lie to your face and you're probably not going to know it. Hmm. And I just believe, well, we're all win-win. No, -win. yeah, we're not all win-win. Right. So... Trust in my intuition and just know that my body knows when someone walks down the door whether I should work with them. I just have to be listening. Mm. That was a huge, huge learning for me. Um, and that'll probably make me a better entrepreneur over time. And you're saying, so what are some of the some of the the beliefs I had? Or like what I'm not sure I understand your question. Yeah, it's just more what are the things that you remind yourself now or the way you think? Just trying to get into your brain basically that mm makes you approach certain problems or solutions in a different way that maybe other okay. people think about it conventionally? Most language is broken. And you know what you do when you spell a word? You're actually casting a spell. So language is computer code that runs on your body's operating system. And your body's operating system is different than a computer's operating system because it's mm. dumber. It can't do all the logical operators that computer code can do. Uh, so you may have learned at 40 years of Zen that if you, your intention is don't be evil, your body can't understand the negative. And all it hears is be evil. 
<laughs> but a computer can understand don't be evil, right? So you have to understand the power of language. If you say need to, it means you'll die if you don't do it. If you say want to, it means you'll be stuck in a state of desire instead of having it. If you say something's impossible or that you can't, you're always 100% lying. You're lying to yourself and you're lying to the people around you. So the number one principle that I follow is I do not tell lies, ever. The tiniest lie that I can detect, I will not tell it. To yourself. Mean, to myself or to anyone else. Yeah. It, it's energetic, and there are studies that support this now, it's energetically really taxing to tell lies to people hmm. because it feels bad, and then you have to remember it, and then you get stressed that you probably didn't remember which lie you told to which person. And in my early 20s, I lied all the damn time to make sure you know, it wasn't my fault and all the mm. sort of stuff that, that happens Politics, with, yeah. with narcissism and friend groups and just learning. I mean, this is a common thing in teenagers too. Sure. Maybe I was immature. But at a certain point, you're not going to find me now saying, I can't make it to the airport to pick you up. I don't say it anymore. I say, I'm not going to make it because mm. I can. If I really wanted to make it, I probably could put a charter airplane on my Amex corporate card since I run the company. It might be really bad for my cash flow. And I probably could get my ass there if I really, really wanted to, right? The reality is I'm not going to, and that's okay. So using words that are truthful, I don't say I need to do that. It's I'm going to do that. I'm mm. not going to do that, right? I want to do that. Sometimes I'll use the words I want to, but I never, dear God or great spirit or whatever energetics I'm working with, I never say, my desire is to want to do this. Mm. Great. I grant you the wanting state. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work. Mm. So I'm very, very precise with my language when I'm talking to myself and with my kids especially. And we used to get in these arguments. Daddy, it's impossible to travel to the middle of the sun without a rocket right now. And, and I'd look at it, my son, who's maybe five or six, and I'd say, sure it is. He goes, what do you mean? I said, change the laws of physics. And he goes, I don't know how to do that. I go, okay, so what you're telling me is you don't know how to go to the middle of the sun without a spacesuit right now, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, me either. So what the reality is you don't have the knowledge, you don't have the time, you don't have the resources. There is enough electrical generation capacity on the planet right now to do what you want to do with known technologies. So to do what you want to do, you're going to have to invent a new type of electrical whatever. The reality is that idea probably isn't worth the amount of work mm. that it takes with what we know today. Right. And then you can move on. But it's the belief in the impossible. There are guys out there right now, it drives me insane, okay? I've worked in the field of longevity for 25 years, okay? We have been diligently working on how to extend human lifespan. I learned from people in their 80s when I was in my 20s what we could do. Mm -hmm. It just opened my eyes. And then you look at all these ancient literature from all these different practices of making us live longer. And we now have aging clocks. You can truly determine how old someone is versus their calendar age for the first time in recent history or maybe in all of history. And so I'm, I read a book. I'm saying, well, here's why I'm going to live to at least 180. Here's the evidence for it. And I've talked to all the companies doing all the things that extend human life. One injection can make you nine years younger today with gene therapy, and I've done it. Wow. And then you get other people who come along and they'll say, well, I'm a surgeon. And I was fat and tired. Now I'm a longevity doctor because I get paid a lot more. And here's my book that says that we will not be able to extend human lifespan. So the most you could do is exercise all the time, take statins, and make sure you get vaccinated. And I'm a longevity doctor. You know what I'm talking about? Do I know who specifically? Yeah. Uh, I might, but I don't want to say it. It's Peter Atia. Peter Atia, yeah. Yeah. So, Peter... In your book, you say we will not be able to extend human lifespan. You are not a longevity doctor. You're an <laughs> exercise fetishist. And that's okay. I love you, brother. Dave, but starting beef here. I love it. I'm not starting beef. <laughs> but for the rest of us who are actively extending human lifespan, stop. Because really, we're doing it. And it's funny. Right before, the year before the Wright brothers flew... JP Morgan's banker goes on public record saying, man will never fly. 
and yeah. it's happening right now. So we are unlocking the keys to extending human lifespan and we're unlocking the keys to new levels of consciousness, new levels of cognitive function. Mm. And it's happening right now. And there are billions and billions of dollars going into it and all kinds of companies doing it. And it's the coolest time ever. Yeah. And yet you still have people out there going, you can't. Well, actually you can, you just don't know how. Mm. Yeah, well, we'll do it. We'll do it one day. I mean, I appreciate your your optimism, the 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 inspiration that you have around this this field, Dave. Um, I really thank you for for coming on the show, and I want to make sure people learn more about biohacking conference that are coming up. Yep. What else would you like them to take away from this episode? All right, there's a couple of things. Biohackingconference.com. Uh, come hang out. It's going to be fun. You going to be there? I will be. Awesome. So we'll see us about there. And then 40yearsofzen.com. Uh, it is a high-end five-day intensive program. It's like running a marathon with your brain every day. Um, if you'd like to learn more, 40yearsofzen.com. Uh, and then upgradelabs.com. We're opening here in Austin in the middle of April. Nice. Can't wait. Here. Yeah. That'll be really fun. Awesome. Dave, thanks so much for coming on. That's been my pleasure. Perfect. Thanks so much to me, guys.